Welcome everyone and thank you for joining us for today's webinar, United Against Corruption, to mark International Anti-Corruption Day, which takes place this Saturday, the 9th of December. I'm Kylie Kilgour, one of the Deputy Commissioners at IBAC, and I'll be facilitating this event today. And I'd like to start by acknowledging and paying respect to the traditional custodians of the land that we are broadcasting from. I'm on the land of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, and I pay respect to their elders past, present and emerging. I also respectfully acknowledge the traditional custodians of the lands and waterways across Australia and pay respect to elders past, present and emerging and to any First Nations people joining us today. 20 years ago, the UN General Assembly adopted the Convention Against Corruption and designated 9th of December as International Anti-Corruption Day to raise awareness of corruption and how to combat and prevent it. Australia ratified the convention in 2005 the theme of this year's International Anti-Corruption Day is uniting the world against corruption. And today, IBAC has united with the NAC and the Victorian Ombudsman to bring you this webinar. We have three highly experienced corruption busters making up the panel today. The Honourable Paul Brereton, the inaugural commissioner of the National Anti-Corruption Commission. Acting Commissioner Stephen Farrow, who's our acting commissioner at IBAC currently. And the Victorian Ombudsman, Ms Deborah Glass. Commissioner Brereton has been a solicitor, barrister, senior counsel, judge of, and judge of appeal of the Supreme Court of New South Wales, Deputy Chair of the New South Wales Law Reform Commission and Deputy President of the Defence Force Discipline Appeal Tribunal. Paul joins us via a live stream from his Canberra office today. Stephen Farrow joined IBAC in July 2021 as a Deputy Commissioner and he was appointed Acting Commissioner in December 2022. Stephen began his career as a solicitor and has extensive experience in public law and policy. His previous roles include Deputy Chairperson of the Adult Parole Board, Chief Executive Officer of the Sentencing Advisory Council and roles in the Department of Justice and Community Safety, focusing on terrorism and criminal law reform. And Deborah Glass began her 10 year term as Victorian Ombudsman in March 2014 and is the first woman to serve in this role. Before becoming Victoria's Ombudsman, she undertook roles overseas in banking, financial regulation and police oversight, most recently as the Deputy Chair of the Independent Police Complaints Commission of England and Wales. So a couple of quick housekeeping things before we go any further. There is a button in the meeting controls to turn on closed captions if you'd like to use that tool. And you can also click the interpretation button to see our Auslan interpreters who are helping us today. And a recording of the webinar will be made available on the IBAC website in the coming weeks. So first of all, I'd like to start off by asking Commissioner Brereton the first question for the panel. So Commissioner Brereton, noting the National Anti-Corruption Commission is able to investigate conduct that occurred both before or after your office was established, what are your immediate priorities and areas of focus? And what are the challenges you face as a new commission? Thanks, Carly. Before answering your question, I too would first like to acknowledge that I'm joining you from the land of the Ngunnawal people, the traditional custodians of the lands and waterways in and around Canberra. I pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging, and I also acknowledge First Nations people participating today. So from the outset of the Commission, we embraced as our mission enhancing integrity in the Commonwealth public sector by deterring, detecting and preventing corrupt conduct involving Commonwealth public officials through education, monitoring, investigation, reporting and referral. When we began in July, two things were in front of mind. The first was that we had to have the capability from day one to receive, triage and begin assessing referrals. We achieved that and we continue to do so every day. This week we reported 2,247 referrals since the 1st of July, with 13 preliminary investigations now underway, nine new investigations opened, in addition to six invest existing investigations we inherited from ACTA. A second priority was and remains engaging with and educating our jurisdiction about key concepts relevant to our functions. Who is a Commonwealth public official? What is corrupt conduct? How do you make a referral? And our Commission's powers. 
We've also been providing guidance for public officials in grappling with the difficult ethical questions and challenges that they will inevitably encounter. I think this educational function is just as important as our work in corruption detection and investigation, which I'll now turn. In that area, our focus is on matters in which a corruption investigation will add value in the public interest. So as I've said elsewhere, the Commission is more likely to be interested in matters involving senior public officials, in issues that have a significant impact, financial or otherwise, on the public interest, or matters that involve potentially systemic corrupt conduct as opposed to one-off acts. That's not to say that one-off acts by less senior staff aren't important, but usually they can be appropriately addressed without requiring the intervention of the Commission. And while, as you've observed, the Commission has the power to investigate conduct that occurred before its establishment, we'll more likely be interested in investigating matters that have current practical relevance than rather than those that are historical. That's not to say that matters occurring before our establishment might not have current practical relevance. For example, if they concern individuals who are still in office. On the other hand, there may be little value in reinvestigating a matter that has already been the subject of a full inquiry in a different forum. Turning to the challenges, perhaps the greatest is posed by the very large expectations which many hold of the Commission. Many seem to believe that we can solve every problem in the public administration of the Commonwealth. Unfortunately, we can't. Not every mistake or act of maladministration is corrupt. Generally, there needs to be an element of private benefit or dishonesty, not just negligence or even incompetence for conduct to be corrupt. We can only investigate a small proportion of the numerous matters that are referred to us, and we won't be able to investigate even every matter that crosses the threshold of being or involving serious or systemic corrupt conduct. As I've said, we'll focus on the matters where we can add value in the public interest. The second challenge is that anti-corruption commissions have often become controversial and fallen out of favour with various of their stakeholders, sectors of the public, the media, or the government of the day. That's what the nature of our work dictates, that there'll be times that a decision we make, for example, on whether to open an investigation or to hold a public hearing or the outcome of an investigation will be unpopular in at least some and often all the courts. This is inevitable and as an independent anti-corruption commission that accepts public scrutiny to the extent operational considerations permit, we must accept this and carry on, as I've said, fearlessly but fairly. Finally, we can't achieve our aim of enhancing integrity in the governance of the Commonwealth on our own. We need ethical leadership and a pro integrity culture. Above all, this means that the careers of people who do the right thing, particularly when it's unpopular to do so, must be seen to prosper and not perish on the wayside. Thanks for that, Paul. And that all um, chimes beautifully, actually, with a lot of the work that we're doing here at IBAC. So I'm now going to um, bring in Stephen Farrow, our Acting Commissioner. Uh, and we're going to talk a little bit about the subject of the definition of corrupt conduct oh. and the differences that there are in that definition, because it's often a subject that comes up um, about the IBAC jurisdiction, but also now we've got the NAC and other, um, other jurisdictions are different. So, Stephen, I'd just like to invite you just to comment a bit about your reflections on the definition of corrupt conduct under the IBAC Act and how that might differ to um, definitions for other integrity commissions. Thanks, Carly. And it's certainly something that causes confusion because there are multiple different um, definitions. Uh, in fact, because um, today is um, in honour of the United Nations uh, Convention Against Corruption, which um, was uh, inaugurated exactly 20 years ago on Saturday, I had a quick look to see um, how that deals with the definition of corrupt conduct. And um, interestingly, it doesn't. Um, so uh, that convention has a series of definitions of, of key terms like 
uh, public official, but it doesn't actually define corrupt conduct. I think that's a matter that's left to states' parties. What it does is to set out a series of obligations about preventing such conduct, about uh, exposing it, about having appropriate avenues to um, address it through criminal prosecution. Uh, it descends into specific obligations around things like um, transparent, merit-based um, appointment processes for public officials, something that's very topical in Victoria. Uh, <clears throat> things like transparent funding of uh, candidates for public office, uh, open and competitive procurement processes and so on, which give a sense of um, the intended meaning of corrupt conduct, but it isn't a, a defined term there. Mm. Um, when we come to the definition in Victoria, uh, before going into um, the specific definition, I think it's useful perhaps to step back and think about the, the, the spectrum of um, um, undesirable conduct in public administration to orient us to where different definitions might place us on that spectrum. Um, Paul earlier talked about maladministration. So at one end of the spectrum, we've got um, things we could describe as maladministration. So they're generally things like, um, you know, um, poor decision making, um, bad judgment, um, misuse of public resources, <clears throat> gross negligence in um, the exercise of administrative functions. Uh, and the remedies for that sort of conduct might be disciplinary um, measures. When we move into uh, the misconduct part of the spectrum, um, there we're talking about more um, conscious departures from rules, um, so less about negligence or um, uh, mistake and more about um, conscious departures, intentional or reckless conduct, but falling short of criminal conduct uh, and appropriate remedies. Again, are disciplinary, but might be uh, things like demotion or, or dismissal from office. Um, and at the further end of the spectrum, we have criminal conduct, uh, and that's where we're talking about offences like bribery or embezzlement. Uh, a key one for Victoria is the offence of misconduct in public office. That's a, a common law offence. And it's a little confusing because it uses the word misconduct in its title. Um, but the elements of the offence make it very clear that uh, it requires conduct that is so significant it merits criminal punishment, uh, as distinct from those other sorts of remedies I've spoken about. Um, so. In, and, and the remedies, of course, for criminal conduct are, are criminal sanctions, fines, um, community correction orders, um, suspended sentences or imprisonment. So um, we've got that spectrum. In Victoria, uh, in terms of our public sector jurisdiction, IBAC's jurisdiction is limited to criminal conduct, so that far end of the spectrum. Uh, and that's when we're dealing with uh, governments, statutory agencies, uh, local government, uh, the courts, so we have jurisdiction over courts, magistrates, judges, um, tribunal members, uh, as well as members of parliament and their staff. But in respect of all of those public sector um, officials, uh, it has to be criminal conduct. We do have a distinct jurisdiction in relation to police, and that's really because police have such significant powers uh, that there's a, an additional level of oversight that's exercised by IBAC. Uh, and so in relation to police, we move into that misconduct part of the spectrum uh, and we can look at conduct for example that involves disgraceful or improper conduct or conduct that might bring Victoria Police into disrepute falling short of criminal conduct and in relation to criminal conduct uh, when we're dealing with police we've got jurisdiction um, where there's allegations of summary offences by police so that's criminal offending at the lowest end of the, um, the, the criminal range uh, whereas in the public sector, our jurisdiction is limited not just to criminal conduct, but indictable criminal offences, so the more serious criminal offences. So our jurisdiction depends on criteria like um, dishonest exercise of public functions, um, breach of public trust, uh, misuse of public information or information that's gathered um, in the course of um, performing duties as a public official, but it also has to constitute a relevant offence, which is an indictable criminal offence. Mm. Uh, that is different to some other jurisdictions in Australia, and um, Paul might make some observations in relation to the National Anti-Corruption Commission, which has a, a broader jurisdiction which extends into um, that misconduct part of the spectrum. But uh, it, it's certainly an area that um, is the topic of significant discussion and debate. Uh, ultimately, it's a matter for Parliament exactly where the, the lines are drawn in any particular jurisdiction. But uh, I guess what's key is that there's... Um, appropriately resourced and um, empowered bodies to deal with 
um, conduct at each point in that spectrum. Uh, in Victoria, our jurisdiction is focused on that criminal end of the spectrum. And so I might just um, invite Deborah mm. as well to speak about this because it's almost like you pick up where we leave off. We, we do, and it, it, it. it's such an important mm. area where mm. the boundaries are, are quite porous so mm. often, mm. and we do need to work very closely together. Classic example, Operation Watts. Yes. Uh, but but I, I think it's also worth pointing out that if there is one area the public just does not get, especially here in Victoria, it's that there is a distinction between between corruption and wrongdoing. I mean, mm. people see the outcome of something like an Operation Watts or a Red Shirts case and say, well, people have done something wrong. It must be corrupt. Mm. What are you doing about it? Mm. So th there is, I think, a really quite unfortunate mismatch between a perception of corruption and, the, and what the law says corruption is. And, and you know, that is that area of grey corruption that we talked about in Operation Watts, where where people have misconducted themselves, but it falls short of the, of the criminal threshold. Now, the fact that there are so many different definitions of corruption around Australia, I, I think doesn't help. Mm. But um, it, it's, as a member of the public, you see somebody has done something wrong and you think something should happen as a result of that. Mm. And then, you know, we find ourselves in the really difficult position a, 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 as integrity agencies of explaining, well, actually, there, you know, there, there appear to be no consequences. Mm. And there are really two dimensions, as you say. There's the, <clears throat> the dimension in terms of jurisdiction, so what is it that we as a body can investigate. There's also the dimension of what do we label, what we've found. Mm -hmm. uh, and often there's, I think, confusion where um, people might be familiar with um, the findings of a body like the Independent Commission yeah. Against Corruption in New South Wales, which has a very different um, jurisdiction, but it, it labels what it found as corruption. I'm Indeed. sure when the National Anti-Corruption yeah. Commission mm -hmm. uh, ultimately mm -hmm. reports on uh, its current investigations, again, um, there'll be issues around, well, that's corruption, that's but is yes. it different to what we find it's in Victoria? It's not Victorian corruption. Yeah. It's some, somebody else's corruption. And, and I think that is genuinely Certainly. confusing. Yes. Well, and just to add to the confusion, mm. can I bring Paul in now as mm. well? Um, your reflections on the definition that you're working with um, under your legislation. Any early insights into how that's um, working for you? So for us, the definition of corrupt conduct has four elements. The first is conduct by a public official in breach of the public trust. And that imports concepts like fraud on a power, uh, similar to the equitable notion of use of a power or a trust power for an improper purpose. That can cover conduct by a public official making a decision or exercising a discretion for a collateral purpose not intended when the power is conferred. And in that way, it can capture conduct that is not criminal conduct. The second is a public official committing an act or that is or involves an abuse of the public official's office. Generally speaking, that will overlap with the uh, crime of misconduct in public office but not necessarily because there can be an abuse of office that doesn't satisfy that element of being such as to merit criminal conduct. So that too can involve conduct that is not criminal as well as conduct that is. The third category is misuse by a public official or a, pub, a former public official of official information. And the fourth is conduct by any person that could affect the honest and impartial discharge by a public official of the public official's functions. Uh, I think breach of public trust lies at the heart of most of the corrupt conduct that we will examine. And the conduct that we will examine is by no means necessarily criminal. A lot of corrupt conduct will be criminal, but it need not be. And I don't start from the position of asking whether conduct is criminal or not. That's a sort of byproduct of the exercise. Mm. Uh, our starting point is doesn't feel, uh, fall within our definitions of corrupt conduct. And then along the track, we may say, well, actually, we can identify these crimes mm. as well and refer it if so minded. Yeah. Something that so, I think is um, useful to think about as well is um, the nature of our investigative powers. So. Mm. Um, 
and part as a function of our jurisdiction, IBAC's got very significant investigative powers. Um, for example, we can apply to a court to obtain a search warrant, not to search public premises, but to search, for example, a, a, a private individual's home or, or um, other private premises. Uh, we can obtain telecommunications interception warrants, so to tap people's phones and so on, um, surveillance device warrants. So very, very significant powers to investigate serious criminal offending. Uh, and so we've developed expertise and capabilities um, in dealing with those sorts of criminal investigations. Uh, that's a, a sort of a distinct capability and a niche that we exercise for our part of that spectrum. Uh, those powers aren't necessarily um, appropriate um, or proportionate to investigations as you move further along the spectrum into misconduct. And so in uh, each jurisdiction, um, deciding which bodies are appropriate to target different parts of the spectrum. I think there are some interesting questions around um, what sorts of powers and capabilities are appropriate uh, for which types of conduct that are being investigated. And certainly in Operation Watts, um, which we jointly did with the Ombudsman, um, we were investigating members of parliament and their staff. Ultimately, uh, allegations of criminal conduct weren't substantiated. Um, and we made some observations and recommendations around um, conduct by members of parliament that falls short of criminal conduct, mm. where there was really a gap mm. in terms of a body that was suitably empowered um, to target that sort of conduct. And it's encouraging that the government's indicated its intention to accept our recommendation to establish a parliamentary yeah. integrity commissioner to fill that gap in, in um, the suite of integrity bodies um, across the spectrum. Mm. But just to pick up on, on, on uh, one of Paul's points, I think mm. the issue of public trust for me is yeah. crucial yeah. because forms of <clears throat> conduct that fall short of the criminal breach public trust. Mm. And mm. it's really important for lawmakers to be aware of the consequences of that. So there needs to be somebody, whether it's an IBAC, an ombudsman, a parliamentary integrity commission, whoever, mm. somebody, you know, there needs to be some independent agency that is able to address what people see as potential breaches of public trust. Mm. And because that is often at the heart of when the absolutely. public are saying to us... It's wrong. Surely it's that's corruption. Yes. Exactly. It is that breach of public trust issue that really yes. is what the public are, are exactly. speaking out about. Exactly. So, sorry, Stephen. Mm. Well, and that's exactly what, um, you know, the, the United Nations um, Convention Against Corruption was very mm. much about. It was about that corrosion of uh, trust, um, you know, confidence in government and so on. And, and, and that sort of non-criminal but... Um, breaching public trust is is very corrosive mm. of mm. Um, you know of a, um, a, a confidence in government, good government. Now I'm just going to switch mm -hmm. to a very particular question that we've got for Deborah because Deborah, it's it's coming up to the end of your ten year term. Congratulations on Surviving. all the work that you've done, <laughs> um, and it's also fifty years of an ombudsman in Victoria. Mm. So you've also got a you know a massive body of work behind the institution as well. And so we really thought it was a great opportunity to ask you to reflect on your time in office and all the issues you've investigated, and what advice you have for public servants about their role in combating and preventing corruption and improper conduct. Well, thank you for that large question, Kylie. <laughs> I, I, I will it's try and break one. it down into, into into a few small elements. Advice for public servants, well, there, there, there are two aspects of that. You know, one is, well, what do you do if you, if you see misconduct, wrongdoing, corrupt conduct, you know, whatever? And I think that is genuinely difficult. So I, if I can just reflect for a moment on the report I put out yesterday mm. to the alleged politicisation of, of, of the public sector, we, we, one of the things that, that was so difficult to deal with in that investigation were people who were afraid to speak to us. So the what is... And these are potential whistleblowers. Mm. You know, these are people who are concerned about something that has gone on in, in, in the public sector that they don't feel comfortable, but they don't even feel comfortable talking to an integrity agency with a promise of anonymity. Mm. So what are we to say to whistleblowers you know, to, to, to ensure that people feel confident about reporting corrupt conduct? I think that's genuinely difficult. And, and, and so one of the recommendations I made yesterday was, was shoring up the independence of the public sector and, and, and providing some degree of protection for the kind of at-will termination of executive contracts that, that, that we know stands in the way of people speaking out. Mm. But I, I think if, if we're talking about broadly whistleblowing and reporting of, of, of poor conduct more broadly, it, it does depend on the level you are within an organisation. You, know, you can be anonymised as a middle manager 
Mm. You know, uh, it's you know that's not difficult. When you're a when you're a head of an agency, you know, when you're very senior, then it is much much more difficult. And I don't think there is an easy answer to that one. I really don't. I, mm. I, you know, I do think that something needs to change mm. for that to to, to address those very real um, fears mm. that, that, that people have. Uh, but if I can perhaps just, just flip to the other side of the coin and say, you know, well, what, what, what do we see? Mm. You know, so, you know, what, what, what would be my broader advice to, to, um, to public servants about, well, how do you, you know, what issues have I seen in my nearly 10 years in the job? <laughs> I, I, um, there, there probably is a moment of deep sigh there because if I look at the reports of my predecessor from, you know, 10 and more years ago, I'm still reporting on the same themes. Mm. Mm. And I suspect the next ombudsman will be reporting on the same yeah. themes. You know, I'm reporting on conflicts of interest. Yeah. I'm reporting on nepotism, on favoritism, on, 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 uh, on uh, you know, misuses of public funds. Mm. And, and sometimes think, you see areas where things are being done better, but then they pop up in some other way. And, and um, it's, uh, it, 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 it is, okay, you know, it, it's frustrating and, and, and occasionally a bit depressing that those themes just come through time and time again. So I, I put out a, a, I call it the misconduct case book mm. last mm. year. Yep. Yep. And the purpose of that really was to say, okay, what, what are we seeing? What are we still seeing here? Why are we still seeing it? Mm. Uh, and, uh, look, and some of the answers are because there are so many people in the public sector, you know, so inevitably your work doesn't get through to, you know, every there are hundreds of thousands of people working there. Uh, but, um, and, and, but, but that doesn't mean that we shouldn't keep trying, you know, sort of keep cranking it out and keep having seminars like this where we do talk about those themes. So why do they happen? Well, sometimes, and not infrequently, they happen because people come into the public sector from the private sector who simply don't get it. You know, mm -hmm. They don't get that conflicts of interest actually are important. They need to be disclosed. An example in the, um, in the case book was the chair of a cemetery trust who, um, who, who really didn't see a conflict in his own company being, uh, being asked, you know, being, being commissioned to dig graves. Mm. Mm. From, you know, from, 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 from his standpoint, they were getting a good deal. So what, what was the issue? Yeah. You know, similarly, um, a, a, a um, somebody who, uh, yeah, that's a, a manager who employed their friend in, in, a, in a recruitment process. Well, they were the best person for the job. Why did I have to follow due process? Mm. So there, there's a lack of understanding of why these things matter. That yeah. I think, you know, that mm. part of the education responsibility of all of us, all integrity agencies, is to just have to explain that. Why, why do these things matter? Mm. So it, it, it's more often not devious. I mean, sometimes it's deliberate, mm. but more often than not, it's just they, people just don't get it. Mm. And it is a, an important but hard slog for integrity bodies and for public servants, particularly senior public servants, to model the, mm. the, those values, the, you know, the, mm. those ethical standards mm. to show why these things matter. Yeah, yeah. And just picking up on your, on your point about whistleblowers and um, turning to you again, Paul, I mean, whistleblowers in the Commonwealth context has been quite, you know, high profile issue recently. I was just wondering if you wanted to um, talk to the, um, the audience a little bit about your approach to um, working with whistleblowers in the NAC. I think we've got world's best standard uh, whistleblower protections. So as far as people disclosing information, or making referrals or giving evidence to the Commission are concerned, uh, they can incur no civil, no criminal, no administrative, no disciplinary liability, and reprisals against them is forbidden under penalty of imprisonment. So there's, there's effectively all the protection you can have for, for someone who makes a referral or a disclosure mm. to the NAC, except, of course, they can't get protection for their own wrongdoing and there's, uh, they're still liable to uh, prosecution for making a false or misleading statement to the NAC. So, yeah, I, I think we offer world's best uh, practice in that area and certainly in the international scene, uh, 
uh, often gets been recognised as uh, better than a lot of the international standards, many of which are subject to a uh, best or good faith requirement, which is seen as putting an onus on a whistleblower to prove good faith mm. as a uh, condition of protection. But we certainly don't have that. Uh, by and large, overwhelmingly, our, our referrals are coming from members of the public. Some of them identify themselves, many of them don't, and they're all treated uh, confidentially. So I think we, we give them not only a high level of protection, but I think it's very important to give them security that uh, their information will be treated confidentially and that they won't be out of this result. Thanks for that. And Stephen, do you want to talk a bit about the Victorian um, Public Interest Disclosure Scheme? Certainly. Well, Tyback has a, a, a role in um, stewarding the scheme. So um, public interest disclosures can be made to a range of different bodies, but then they'll ultimately come to IBAC to make a determination about whether they're what's called a public interest complaint. So even coming forward to make a disclosure, um, someone gains protections under our legislation. Um, even if ultimately IBAC determines that their um, disclosure doesn't constitute what's called a public interest complaint, if it does constitute a public interest complaint, then there's a, an extra layer of protection. But the, the, the structure of the scheme is very much to, uh, to very much protect those who do come forward. Um, there's additional protection for some if, if it meets those criteria, but really everyone coming forward should gain a degree of protection. Um, certainly, I think challenges with this scheme are ensuring that people are aware of it. I think mm. um, certainly IBAC's done a lot of work and, and other partner agencies across the integrity system to, to build awareness of, of the avenues for um, making disclosures. But it, there's also, I think, challenges to make sure that, you know, that, the, that the legislation is applied so that people genuinely do get those protections and that also that they feel that it was worth coming forward. I'm always impressed at the public spiritedness of people who, who do come forward to make a disclosure, knowing that, um, that there's always some risk in doing so. And, um, uh, and so for agencies like mm -hmm. ours, I think it is a, uh, a significant um, responsibility to make sure that um, if there is valuable information, that we can make use of it and, and that people can feel that you know, it's, it's, it's very much worth their while coming forward. And Talia, I, I'm mindful that you asked me about my advice to my successor, and I don't think I answered that question. Oh, yes. What, what, <laughs> so what I, advice are you going to give your successor, well, well, Deborah? Well, specifically about improper <laughs> conduct. I mean, there's yeah. a lot of other advice yeah. that, I, that, you know, that, that I, I might just leave for now. <laughs> but um, uh, improper conduct, I, th I think, it, it is a particularly important part of really all mm. of our work, which is why we're having this mm. conversation today. And I think all of us who work in the integrity will recognise that the, 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 the kind of things that come to us, and I'm sure, Paul, you have seen this in the thousands of, uh, of matters that have been referred to your office, is that it ranges from the incredibly important, you know, and this we really need to, you know, to, to, to dig into this one, and there's, but there's a lot of dross. Mm -hmm. you know, and there, there, there's, there's, there's a lot in there that does not require chasing a lot of rabbits down holes. And the, the importance of triage, the importance of applying really good judgment mm. to what comes in. And it's something, I mean, I, I some of my, well, you can call it the public interest, but actually I call it the so what factor. Mm. You know, when somebody is alleged to, to have done or not done something, well, so what? What were the consequences of that? How important was it? How serious was it? Now, that doesn't rule out the vexatious, the, you know, the, the malicious, because there's always a... a a, a chunk of those in any allegations that, that come to us. But, but sometimes we deal with a, a raft of things where somebody has done something wrong, but it had no consequences. Mm. Mm. And I think one of the things that we need to be aware of in, in, in integrity agencies is, is, well, let's, we've always got limited resources. None of us ever have the uh, amount of resources, you know, we want to, you know, to, to do everything we always want. Uh, so we have to be judicious. We have mm. to use our discretions, I think, mm. really effectively. And applying those discretions, applying you know, what I call the so what factor, I, I think is, is, is what I would be encouraging my successor to do when they look at these allegations in yeah. proper conduct. Yeah, thanks for that. 
So I'm going to turn now to, we've had a number of questions that um, people in the audience have sent in to us. So we're not going to be able to do all of them, but we've tried to um, pick some that are, I guess, representative of the sort of questions that people out there have for the panellists. So I'm going to start with Stephen. And um, so this question is about um, what are your views about the relationship between corruption and organisational culture? Oh, look, I think culture is crucial. It's, it's really the most fundamental issue. When we look at all of our um, investigations, um, I think always there'll be individuals who are motivated um, to gain a, a personal benefit. Uh, but I think the, 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 what we find in our investigations where things go wrong are often it's because of a lack of culture. Uh, a culture in terms of having clear systems and processes um, that are well understood, um, actually a culture of following those processes and rules, um, real rigour around any departure from the processes and rules, if there are exceptions that they're applied rigorously, um, proper documentation, uh, and a culture of speaking up about concerns. Um, these sorts of factors mean that even if there are individuals who are motivated to try and um, you know, get personal gain or um, to act corruptly, it's the organisations that are more resistant to corruption, if you've got all of these things in place, the appropriate checks and balances. A lot of our work is around um, prevention, so identifying red flags, the sorts of cultural features which can really uh, enable corruption to flourish. Uh, and that's really building on our experience of investigations where we've seen things that have gone wrong, but also consulting and working across different sectors, particularly in areas like procurement, for example, where we can learn from good practice, we can learn from what are the things that make um, different organisations more resistant. Um, and even in terms of the, um, you know, the police jurisdiction uh, and, and police misconduct, um, looking at different police stations um, mm. where there seem to be pockets of um, larger numbers of substantiated complaints, even looking at the demographics and so on, there seems to be often cultural factors about things that are, um, are tolerated, where people don't speak out, the influence of particular individuals who can be quite influential in um, perpetuating or maintaining a culture that's, <clears throat> um, you know, encouraging of misconduct as opposed to um, uh, making it resistant. And it, it's not necessarily complicated. We've got lots of checklists of things like um, red flags to watch out for, but I, I think ultimately so much depends on the culture and so much depends on leadership. Um, it's about setting the standard, modelling the behaviour from the top, um, making sure that the expectations are understood uh, and are followed through. Mm. And Paul, <coughs> at, the, at the national level, you know, we're, I mean, everyone's really conscious about the Robo Debt Royal Commission findings, some of which definitely spoke to the culture in the APS. Um, I was reading the um, APSC's results about, you know, their findings about how many public servants in Canberra and nationally have gotten themselves into strife in recent times. Um, what, are, what are you seeing from your vantage point around the relationship between culture and uh, corruption risks? It's culture that sets expectations and standards as to how people behave. Mm. So culture is fundamental as to how they will respond in a particular situation, in particular in a stressful situation. So I think what's really important about culture is that in the public sector, people don't feel constrained to report other than honestly and accurately. They don't feel constrained to give advice or to make decisions other than on the evidence and the merits impartially and honestly. And they don't feel constrained from admitting their mistakes and remedying them. Uh, they're, they're the key elements of the culture that we need to embed in our public institutions. And Deborah, I mean, obviously you've had 10 years in the Victorian Ombudsman Chair. Um, what are your views about how, I guess, Victoria at least is tracking in terms of corruption and misconduct risk? Have things changed in the time that you've been in your role? Well, what I see is that allegations have gone up, but I don't, that doesn't mm. mean that corruption has got worse. Mm. And, and this is, it's a particularly difficult point to address because there is no objective scientific assessment of actual corruption. There mm. is perceived corruption, we, we know we can assess that. Uh, reported corruption, we can assess that. But actual, how can we possibly assess that? So my, my 
and this is impressionistic because it must, it can only be impressionistic, mm. is that there, there is more confidence, you know, despite what I, I said earlier about fear, because I think that fear is still there, but I think there is more confidence in the integrity agencies dealing with matters. Mm. Um, there, it's more visible that um, corrupt conduct will be exposed. I think you know, public hearings assist that enormously, public reports assist that enormously. So what, I've, what I see is that allegations increase, and they have increased in the last 10 years broadly for I think both of our, our agencies. But I think that speaks more to a higher level of confidence that something is gonna be done when people come forward. Mm. And just on that, that topic of you know, the, the importance of the public facing work that the integrity agencies do and how that actually encourages people to, to engage with the system and bring issues to the table. Um, can you just talk a bit about like, how do you pick, what do you do public reports about? And I'll ask Stephen and I'll ask Paul the same question. It's public interest, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, it, it, well, that, you know, that, that, that's, that, that's a deciding factor. If, if it's not, is it systemic? Is it something? So, for example, I, I've, I've put out public reports. I mean, I, I probably do about between 20 and 30 mm. um, formal investigations involving whistleblower matters every year, and I would put out perhaps two of those as public reports. So I don't do public hearings in, in my role, but I have a discretion mm. as to what I report on publicly. So the, report, the reports I put out will be those that I think are relevant to a, a much broader audience than simply that agency. Mm. Uh, so it may be systemic or it may just be something that, that needs to be said. Uh, the examples would be uh, the, um, the CEO, usually ones involving you know, senior leadership, yeah. Yeah. making the point that Stephen has made earlier about <laughs> ethical leadership and the importance of, of, of leadership driving culture, uh, where you point out, well, if, if the CEO is hiring their mates and the those lower down see the CEO hiring their mates, then they will start hiring their mates, and then you have a you obviously have a very poor culture in that organisation. So, it, it, so I will put out and I have put out reports that involve senior people not getting it and the consequences of that on on public trust. Mm. And I do that because there is an important public interest message, not mm. only to other local councils or heads of agencies, but also to, the, to those brave whistleblowers who are prepared to say the CEO is doing something wrong. Mm. And Stephen, IBAC and our special reports? Um, well, perhaps just um, first touching on the question of you know, measuring mm. corruption and the, the intrinsic difficulties. I suppose I do want to highlight the work that IBAC has been doing in um, building an evidence base. Mm. We're only um, 10 years old, so we haven't had a great deal of time to do so. But um, in terms of perceptions of corruption, the surveying that we do um, also asks quite specific questions. So, for example, if we survey um, suppliers of um, goods and services to the government, you know, have you um, personally experienced um, corrupt conduct? Have you seen it occur? Uh, and gathering those results over time, um, likewise in local government, likewise um, amongst members of parliament, different sectors that we um, periodically survey so that over time we can build up a picture because relying on substantiated mm -hmm. complaints, mm -hmm. prosecutions and so on is, is intrinsically difficult. But, but I think we, we are doing something to try and get a bit of an evidence base around that. Mm. Uh, in terms of how do we prioritise, um, you know, we've all got finite resources. Um, a question for us is always, uh, is there some other agency that's better placed to do this or is there a, a particular reason why we should do this? Um, so, for example, because our jurisdiction covers criminal conduct in the, the public sector, you know, if it's a, uh, an instance of fraud, uh, is there any reason why, for example, this shouldn't be prosecuted by police like any other matter of fraud? Or is there some extra dimension, the seriousness, the systemic nature of it, um, the fact that it potentially exposes some corruption vulnerabilities that... Um, Part of our role is to investigate, but part of our role is also to identify systemic issues and to make recommendations to fix them. So often it's a question of is this investigation a vehicle to, to draw out um, some of those more systemic issues and make um, recommendations to in, ensure that there's a more enduring um, change to the culture. Mm. And Paul, <clears throat> the, I mean, obviously it's early days for the NAC and you haven't had a chance to do a report yet, I don't think. Um, 
But your, your initial thoughts at this stage um, in the evolution of the NAC around the public reporting and the public facing work that you'll be doing? Look, I think the public facing work is, and the public reporting is absolutely crucial to achieving our end, except where it's going to compromise further proceedings or jeopardise further proceedings or where it's going to unfairly uh, tarnish reputations, I strongly favour publishing our work and uh, I'll have a strong uh, predisposition to publish as, much, as many of our reports as we can. Mm. But we have to publish a report if it's, uh, if we conduct a public hearing, but as I think most know, the circumstances in which we can conduct a public hearing are limited, but um, even after investigations in which there is no public hearing, we can still publish a report uh, if that's in the public interest to do so, and I think ordinarily it will be in the public interest to mm. do so. And I think one of the interesting aspects of the NAT jurisdiction is you've got a power to hold public hearings into um, systemic issues. Yes. That's very different to any of the other integrity commissions. Um, so I, I was just wondering if you'd like to um, just tell the audience a bit more about that function, because it, it is going to be a quite a, a specific, different sort of function that you're going to have. Well, it, it's a power to conduct an inquiry as distinct from a corruption investigation mm. uh, into corruption risks and vulnerabilities in an agency or more generically. So one of the issues that I've flagged, and I suppose, in the past is you know, one area that might be of interest is the way in which uh, contracted service providers deliver services on behalf of government to beneficiaries. That might be an area in which a public inquiry into uh, corruption risks and vulnerabilities would be of considerable assistance. Mm. Uh, there are, of course, others. Now, that public inquiry, it's a bit like, uh, rather than an investigation into a specific uh, allegation or issue of corruption, a more roving Royal Commission type uh, inquiry into a subject matter which would produce recommendations at the end rather than corruption findings. Thanks for that. I think it's going to be really interesting to see um, how that, that bit of your jurisdiction evolves. And like I said, none of the rest of us have got it, so we're, we're um, looking on very jealously, I think, some of us. But um, you're going to get to do some of um, the work. I think I think New South Wales has a similar. Oh, do they? Okay. Yeah. Great. Um, so, Stephen, I'm going to ask you a question now about how we at IBAC decide what are our priorities for investigations. Well, I think much, you touched on some yeah, of that a bit before. So perhaps they're very much based on um, the evidence that we gather. Um, so it'll be informed by. Um, you know, the investigations we've conducted. We've got a strategic intelligence area, so they monitor trends. Um, we've got a lot of intelligence from our complaints about patterns. Uh, and from all of that, uh, we, we, you know, we engage with a range of stakeholders as well about the matters that are of concern to them. Uh, and really, to help with the triaging, we get um, three and a half, four thousand or more um, complaints each year to process, to make decisions about um, which of those might turn into the perhaps 30-odd um, preliminary inquiries or investigations we conduct each year. Uh, we have a, a set of strategic priority areas, strategic focus areas, uh, and, and they're things like um, you, excessive use of force by police against um, vulnerable communities, um, high-risk police units, divisions and regions, which is based on our um, data around where we find pockets of um, unusually large numbers of complaints and so on. Uh, it's things like uh, improper influence as a, as a theme that's um, been a theme for a number of our uh, more high profile um, special reports. Uh, high risk public sector agencies. So for example, um, at the moment in Victoria, there's very significant volume of um, uh, um, infrastructure work going on, both in transport sector and um, public hospitals and in social housing. So um, where we get large, value um, procurement, um, we'll have a particular focus on that. 
Um, and these strategic focus areas are, are reviewed each year with a sort of a, they, they're relatively stable, but we adapt them over time as um, the information we gather um, unfolds. Mm. Thanks for that. So I've, I should, I should oh, add that no, okay. um, we're not limited to those yeah. strategic focus areas. So if we receive a complaint that falls outside them and yet we decide that there's a sufficient public interest, um, we will obviously uh, pursue that matter. But it, it helps as an organisation um, to sort of mark out the areas that um, will we'll stream matters into. And it, it makes it easier to, to structure our decision making processes rather than going purely case by case. Mm. And now, this is another question from the audience, and I might start with you, Paul. So um, the audience member would, has got a question for the panellists about what are the steps to returning our public sector institutions to more robust, apolitical and professional organisations? Well, that's a, that's a great question. Thanks very much for it. The, I think I've touched on that already when I've spoken about culture. So mm. I see instilling a new approach to decision making in the public sector in which people aren't afraid of the consequences of making the right decision as really important and part of that is instilling a culture of compliance so that legal compliance is seen as not an optional thing the legal compliance is black or white not a risk to be managed mm. i think that's an important step along the way that uh, legal advisors are advising decision makers not about the risk associated with doing something but whether it is lawful or not mm. and all of these messages i think are now well on the way to being instilled in the commonwealth public sector they don't apply just to lawyers they apply more widely to advisors and to decision makers uh, so I, I think there are a couple of key steps, but really, as I concluded my opening remarks, the crucial step is that people who do the right thing, who give unpopular advice, who make unpopular decisions, uh, are seen to do well mm. and not to suffer for the consequences of doing the right thing. And that, if that is seen to happen, that will radically change the attitude to being prepared to do the right thing. Mm. And Deborah, your views, many of which you've outlined in your yeah, report I, that was I released. Think I, I think I broadly covered it, actually. It's, yeah. Um, yeah. Where, where to begin? 280 pages worth. Uh, it, it's... Um, I do think that there are some, some, some really important issues mm. that we, we've seen these trends right around Australia. So these, mm. they are not unique to Victoria. The, 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 the trend of over-responsiveness, which is illustrated by mm. the RoboDebt Royal Commission, something that has been seen in, in New South Wales, the Baralalo case, you know, the, the, these are not uh, unique Victorian problems. Mm. But um, what we also see are steps being taken elsewhere around Australia to try and bring that back to the, the, the core principles of why do we, why do we always have this, you know, this, an, in, an impartial public service? Why mm. does it matter? Mm. Well, it, it matters for a lot of very important reasons. Mm. So let's go back to basics here. You know, of course, governments evolve. Of course, you know, the role of the public sector evolves. But it, it, it should not evolve beyond the boundaries that were established for very good reasons. Mm. Um, many, many years ago to get away from the principles of patronage that originally applied, of course, you mm. know, in, 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 uh, in, in the, civil, the old civil service. So, I mean, I, I, I do think that there are some really significant lessons that need to be learned here that, 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 that starts with shoring up the independence of the, the key uh, appointments right across the, um, the public service. Mm. And Stephen? Oh, look, to take the um, spectrum analogy again, I think, um, you know, you'd have at one end um, the sort of overly responsive, um, unwilling to provide um, unwelcome advice uh, end of the spectrum. At the other end of the spectrum, I suppose, there's the, um, the public service that's unresponsive, indifferent to yeah. government priorities. And, and it's a yep. question of nuance, I think. Uh, it, it, it is about calibrating... Uh, the expectations, yep. and, and this is something that we've looked at in some of our operations, but calibrating uh, within that spectrum um, something that's, and, and I think 
in Victoria, for example, the Victorian Public Sector Commission has some very good guidance and principles around this, but it's, it's responsive, but it's also um, rigorous, um, impartial, uh, you know, frank, um, evidence-based, uh, and that's the key. Okay, so we've got time for one last very quick and very easy question for you all. What's the number one thing organisations could do and should be doing to prevent corruption? And I'm going to start with Paul. Having in place, well, I'll say, I'll say two things. A sound conflicts of interest policy under which everyone understands that conflicts must be declared and then managed and a rigorous mechanism for monitoring the use of information, particularly electronic information, so that everyone knows that their use of information can be monitored. Excellent answer. I think you'll get seconded on that by IBAC. Stephen? Uh, if we, we've limited to one thing, perhaps the thing that occurs to me is um, having an awareness amongst staff that there are avenues to come forward. Mm. Um, so often, almost invariably, someone knows something and is uncomfortable, but the difference often between um, a matter being uncovered or not is whether someone's prepared to, to speak out, even if they haven't got the full story, even if they've only got a piece of information that turns out to be a a crucial piece of information that can trigger an investigation. But I, I think um, if there's one thing, it's it's for um, people at whatever level of an organisation, and it could be someone very junior who just knows that this doesn't look right uh, and who who's confident that they can um, find an avenue to escalate their concern um, and to feel that they can do so without retribution. I think that's the key. And Deborah, what's your top ask? One thing, have a leader who models ethical values mm. and who sets a tone across an mm. organisation that behaviour that, that, you know, that, that must be ethical and that unethical behaviour will not be tolerated. Mm. Great. Um, so thank you to the panellists. We've, we're running out of time. I know there's a lot more questions that people have sent to us and we will do our best to answer those uh, in different ways after today's session. Um, but I'd just like everybody to thank us for joining, oh, sorry, I'd like to thank you all for joining us today and a big thank you again to Commissioner Brereton, Ombudsman Glass and Acting Commissioner Farrow uh, and to everyone who's attended today and our organisers backstage at IBAC for their contribution to today's webinar. We'll send you links to any of the resources that um, people have mentioned today as well as a link to the recording of today's webinar so keep an eye out for that in your inbox and to stay updated on the latest publications and information from IBAC, the NAC and the Ombudsman, you can subscribe to our e-newsletters through our websites and we'll share the links in the chat. We're also regularly sharing updates on social media via X or Twitter, LinkedIn and YouTube, so check those out as well. Mom, even my children are looking at that material, so I highly recommend it to you. Finally, as this webinar comes to an end and you exit Zoom, you'll see a link to complete a short feedback survey to help us plan future events or you can use the QR code on the screen to access the survey. And we take your feedback seriously and we'll appreciate it if you could please provide us with your thoughts on today's webinar. It will help us um, for future events that we'd like to hold. And we look forward to seeing you again at those future events. Um, and very happy Anti-Corruption Day, everybody. <laughs>